This is the fifth in our series of seven summer lectures by the Dominican Brothers, and tonight our lecturer is Brother Justin Bolger. Brother Justin grew up in Maryland. He studied business at the University of Baltimore and earned a master's degree in philosophical studies from Mount St. Mary's University in Emmitsburg, Maryland. He played music as a singer, songwriter, and recording artist, and worked as director of music ministry at, St. Mary, at Mount St. Mary's before, before entering the Dominican order. Uh, please welcome Brother Justin. Something about dying. This is distorting a little bit. A little bit. Sorry, a bit. Um, you heard I was in the music biz for a little bit, so uh, any aural interference kind of disturbs me. So Thomas Aquinas writes in uh, Summa Theologiae, Primus Secunde, Question 94, Article 2, that every substance seeks the preservation of its own being according to its nature. And by reason of this inclination, whatever is a means of preserving human life and of warding off its obstacles belongs to the natural law. In other words, nobody wants to die. Okay, And that's natural. We naturally ward off threats to our own existence. We naturally seek to preserve our life. Now, of course, in some sense, death is natural. As George Harrison famously wrote, um, all things must pass. I think, I think Aristotle and others have had similar observations, right? There is generation and corruption in reality. That's part of life. But I think um, in our age today, we have an extreme aversion to our own mortality. We're really afraid to die. So much so that billions of dollars are poured into the great valley of silicon on technology that could radically extend human life. Now I'm all for medical advancements that heal and strengthen human life, but there are some seriously strange ideas associated with this new movement. So a few years ago I heard about one in particular uh, that would extend life permanently, really. So it involved first off a hologram, you would be projected on a hologram. You know, think uh, Star Wars and Princess Leia but hopefully um, updated as Star Wars was in the 70s. Um, and then the hologram would communicate to you uh, via kind of an algorithm based on your past social media use. So you'd go back into your Facebook and see how you communicated with people. And then your loved ones could then communicate with you for forever. Right? And it would learn more and more. So the, the idea only has to be stated to see how strange it is. I, I wouldn't want anyone communicating with me based on my past uh, Facebook profile. Well, maybe that's just me. Um, of course, there are, there are other reasonable attempts to considerably extend life, but I think the enterprise implies something about our culture's relationship with death. So we're trying to control it, we're trying to master it, to be the masters of mortality through technology and maybe put it off indefinitely. So there are many important implications and issues with this endeavor, but I think an important one, one that I'm going to focus on, is being unprepared for death. Other interesting um, implications is that, you know, if we kind of reject our mortality, uh, we can face a problem of losing our place in the cosmos losing our place as created. And then we can kind of lose the meaning of life, what to love, right? Um, what to live for, uh, what, to, what to die for. Okay, but I'm gonna focus uh, in the beginning here on being, this idea of uh, being prepared or being unprepared. So there's a great scene in this movie called Gravity, it came out a few years ago, starring Sandra Bullock. 
And I think this illustrates well our being ill-equipped for death. So, Sandra Bullock's character is floating around in space, and there's a catastrophe. And she's, she's, working, she's a scientist, she's working on the satellite, and there's a catastrophe, and a lot of things go wrong um, right at the beginning, so I'm not spoiling too much. But she is close to death. She's sitting in um, uh, whatever this little spaceship pod thing is she's, she's working in. And uh, she has this really interesting monologue. She's speaking, I think she's speaking through a, a radio, hoping someone will hear her. But this is what she says. She says, I know we're all going to die. Everybody knows that. But I'm going to die today. The thing is, I'm still scared. Nobody will mourn for me. No one will pray for my soul. Will you pray for me? I pray, but no one ever taught me how. So there's a, that's a, a striking little paragraph right there uh, for many reasons. One being that it actually came from Hollywood. Um, but there's a lot to, lot to talk about there. One interesting thing, though, is that the finality of death touches home for her character, right? She knows she's not ready. So she says, yeah, I know, I know I'm going to die, but I'm going to die today. It's particularized for her. And she's unprepared. We also see in this little um, monologue that she lacks a practice that could help her, namely prayer, right? And she realizes it. Prayer could have helped her, but she never did it. No one ever taught her how. And we see that the prayer is a practice. The practices are taught. They're passed down. And when we stop um, teaching this important practice of prayer, um, we're leaving out something essential, essential knowledge for happiness, for a happy life. Because a happy life terminates in a happy death, which terminates in a happy afterlife. Right? Beatitude is another word we give for heaven, which really just means happiness. So many traditions and practices like prayer that help us understand and accept death with hope, with true Christian hope, have been forgotten or discarded. So I've had the privilege of working in hospital ministry at a couple places, but here in Saint, uh, at St. Elizabeth here in Youngstown. And this topic came up recently. We were di discussing how in a hospital setting, the, the whole interaction between one who has died and their loved ones has become kind of antiseptic, right? So after passing away, a body is often moved quickly out of the room, moved to the morgue, embalmed, sent to the funeral home. So there's a quick separation that happens, right? But in the past, and I can speak um, from the, the great Irish tradition, the, the traditional Irish wake, it was more common for people to die in the home, surrounded by family, parish priest, prayers, music. I was actually able to, to see my grandfather pass this way. He died in our family home, where he had lived for a number of years, and the family was taking care of him. But he was surrounded by his children and grandchildren. The parish priest came for last rites, and it seemed very natural to me as a teenager at that time to pass in this way. It seemed like a holy death. And it gave me the experience and the knowledge of what a holy death looks like. But many people don't get to see this. They don't know what it's like. They don't have that education. So Woody Allen wrote, it's not that I'm afraid to die, I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> so here's this kind of like mixed message about what to do with death. But when you have the experience of, um, this kind of intimate experience of seeing a family member pass away in this way, you know what it's like certain sense when it happens. So there are related issues here. Fear of death, as I spoke about, trying to control it through technology, trying to master it, um, unpreparedness, and loss of practices, such as prayer. Or such as, you know, this, this kind of way of passing within the family home. So what's the answer? How do we begin to resolve this? Well, I think the first one is just faith. It's very simple. 
So at a previous hospital ministry I did, I'll never forget one day when I saw two different women on the same day who had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. They weren't old either. They were young women. One was a mother. She had kids, husband. She was very involved with her parish, Catholic. The other one was a little bit older. Maybe she was in her um, early 50s. And she was more of a loner. She didn't go to church. But their reactions to the diagnosis were totally opposite. For, for the Catholic woman, she responded with like serenity, almost cheer. And for the other, um, it was devastating. Okay? She was almost in denial. She kind of was in denial. Like, this, this isn't happening. So for, for the Catholic woman, God was in control. She spoke about his providence and his care. And this diagnosis didn't dismantle her <clears throat> fundamental faith. It was difficult, but um, it, it really wasn't chipping away at her faith. Um, and for the other, death made no sense. It revealed that life is absurd. Um, that there is a providence. You know, she couldn't handle it. It was interesting that there would be two totally different reactions to, to kind of the same, the same issue. So I realized something that day, that faith is real. Faith makes a difference. It's not just a feeling or an effort that we make or a pious platitude that we talk about. You know, hey, just have faith. Get through it. Um, but no, it's something that we're given. All right? It, it, it comes with our Baptism, the sacraments we receive, our furtherance in grace through prayer. And I'll talk about that a little bit, how faith can grow. But, but there, it is this fundamental gift that we have that makes a difference, that we can know God and we can believe in Him. Believe Him because He is trustworthy. We know He's loving, He's providential. He came to us that we might come to Him. And that then the trials of life, even the trial of death doesn't undermine this knowledge that comes by faith. And I think, too, in, in faith, suffering becomes part of a story, becomes part of a greater story. Because there are always, there's always suffering in life. That's a constant, right? Um, but if you look at any good story, too, any story that you love, whether that be a movie or a novel or something like that, um, there are always setbacks, right? There's always something to overcome. And that's our story as Christians. You can look at salvation history in terms of a good story with setbacks, but ultimately with restoration, right? With um, the fancy French word is denouement, okay? A comic turn, a happy turn. And what's the, the fall? Well, of course, it's Adam's fall. But that's why we sing at the Easter Vigil, anticipating the resurrection, oh, happy fall. Because this, this fall brings about an even greater gift, the gift of Christ, his death, but most of all, his resurrection. Okay, so that we are restored in Christ. And it's faith by which we can have this knowledge and say, yes, happy fall, right? And, and, and yes, what an even greater gift, the resurrection. And through faith that we can see to the other side, we can see beyond the passage of death and see that it is in fact a passage. So saints have had this faith, right? You often read saints, they, they talk about death in a way that's like, wow, I, I'm not really quite there yet. But um, one example of this is St. Francis. So, I've given a few different quotes in this sheet, if you don't have it already, um, so that's on there. So, St. Francis, in his Canticle of the Sun, could speak of Sister Death. All praise be yours, my Lord, through Sister Death, from whose embrace no mortal can escape. Woe to those who die in mortal sin. Happy those she finds doing your will. The second death can do them no harm. Praise and bless my Lord and give him thanks and serve him with great humility. So St. Francis has a refreshing Catholic outlook here. 
that death is one of those last things. You know, we speak of the four last things. Death is one of them. And it's something that no one escapes. But we can prepare throughout our life so that we die in a state of grace at the time of death. Um, but what, is it, what does it mean you know, just to, to die in a state of grace? Well, it means that you kind of live your life facing God, turned towards the Lord, loving Him above all. And that, as Francis says, death can do no harm to someone who serves humbly in this way, lives in this way. So that death ultimately becomes a friend, even a sister. Very intimate idea of death. And of course, St. Paul, he speaks boldly of death. For Paul, we follow Christ, um, and we fall, and, and then. In our life, as we follow Christ, the life of Christ is actually proved out. So Christ suffered, died, and rose again, and we will as well. This is an important theme in Pauline theology, that Christ's life is lived out in us. He writes, we have died with Christ, and we shall live with him. For we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. And if death has no power over Christ, it will have no power for us. So again, this is this kind of knowledge that that woman in the hospital had. You know, this idea that death has no power. And in St. Paul, we see the flowering of the theolo theological virtues, all of them faith. I spoke about faith, but of course there's hope and love. So they even say, for it, to me, love, to live is Christ. To die is, is gain. So he has this very positive appraisal of death, that it's a gain, it's something more. He'll go from glory to glory. So St. Francis and St. Paul are Christian examples for us. So hopefully, like them, we can come to see death in this way. Maybe not perfectly, but we, we can, you know. Gain, gain some of this knowledge, gain some of this, this hope that they have, see death in this, uh, as something good, as something positive. And, um, and so, like I've said as well, that faith is the foundation for this vision. Now, there are other practices and traditions that build off the foundation of faith. Like I said, it's a gift that comes to us in our baptism, but we have to exercise it. Can grow when we exercise it. So I spoke a little bit about prayer, but another tradition that can help us exercise faith, um, I think, is music. So I had the good fortune a few years ago of recording an album with some of the brothers, an album of bluegrass and gospel songs. And I remember when we finished it, one of the friars was listening to it and he said, Hey, you know, this song, this album is very eschatological. It's kind of, it's about the end. It's about death, a holy death. And uh, listening to it, I said, yeah, that's right. I didn't notice that, but yes, it is. What would you give for your soul? This is one of the songs. It's a challenge to what the, Bap the Baptists call a backslide of his own mortality and by God's gratuitous mercy. Angel man which we'll go over a little bit, and that's a, it's one of the happiest songs I've ever heard about the last moments in life. Just a Closer Walk, it's an old jazz tune that's often played in funeral, funeral processions, in New Orleans especially. I had a conversation with a, with a woman at one of our parishes that brought this home well. She approached me after Mass one day and told me that after listening to these songs, this album, she had had a two-fold conversion First, was that she, she was overcoming a fear of death that she had had for a long time. And the second was she was overcoming a hatred of bluegrass music. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure which conversion is more divine. But she you noted know how singing these upbeat songs, happy, joyful songs about something ostensibly morbid, death, had actually helped her. She could do this in a daily way, and it, it kind of helped her to see uh, the subject we're talking about in a new light. Now, there are different genres of music that can help here. I'm just focusing on this one, but 
I think music in general is, is beautiful because it, it really shapes our experiences, the different experiences. So, um, you know, we would have, have solemn music at a mass, especially at a funeral mass, and that's appropriate. Or, you know, dance music at a wedding. You, know, you want to hear some Abba at a wedding reception. I'm sorry, not a wedding mass. At a wedding reception, right? And that's appropriate. Uh, but I think it's, it's interesting to look at bluegrass and old gospel and folk music in the context of death because this music is playful, joyful. And as that moment I mentioned taught me, um, joyful songs about death can be helpful. So I thought I'd sing uh, a verse or two of some of these songs and then talk about them a little bit so that we can learn about a good Christian death a little bit. So here are, here are a few. The, the first one I want to talk about is Angel Band. And uh, the lyrics are printed on your sheet as well. So again, like I said, this is a, a pretty, pretty happy, like, major key um, song about the last moments of life. And I was actually happy that Father Nicholas Ingham celebrated a votive mass of the angels today. Uh, we could meditate a little bit about the role that the angels play, that they're present to us here, and that they have a role bringing us, bringing us back, bringing us to God. So in this song, basically, the, at least the way I see it, there's this singer in his last moments, and, and death is immediate. It's coming. So he begins with a very Pauline sentiment. He sings, My latest son is sinking fast, my grace is near thee run, my strongest trials now are past, my triumph has begun. So this reminds us a lot, I think, of, of St. Paul, especially in 1 Corinthians. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the game exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable degree, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. Or in 2 Timothy, a little bit more pithy, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. So the singer in this tune, like St. Paul, he sees his imperishable prize ahead. His, name, his race is nearly run. His triumph has begun. That, that life has been a race. And even in his last moments, he may be lying down, physically, spent, but he's still racing. His soul's still racing. And then the chorus is, Oh, come, angel band, come and around me stand, bear me This reminded me of Psalm 91. For he will give his angels charge of you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up. So we really get this sense of the, of the angels that will be surrounding us after death. That we, can, that we can look to them, expect them to bear us up. The second verse, um, you'll see it speaks of a longing for Jesus. Like this too, we see that the singer is not speaking of salvation in an abstract way, but of a person who speaks to Jesus, who his heart longs for. But the third verse, I think, is my favorite. I've almost gained my heavenly home, my spirit loudly sings the holy ones behold. Juxtapose this with um, the scene I described earlier from Gravity, you know, with Sandra Bullock's character. She's in her last moments too, but everything is falling apart for her. She doesn't know how to pray, she doesn't know where to begin. Like we said, she's unprepared. 
But for the singer in the song, it's all coming together. The race of life makes sense. The relationship with Jesus makes sense. I think this verse is also kind of eerie, maybe even a little scary too. Uh, the noise of wings, uh, the noise of angel wings, and that'd be kind of weird, you know, hearing that. But, but kind of cool as well, I think. Um, and we know from scripture too that angels are, are very intense. Right? When people usually see them, they, they kind of go, whoa, what's going on? They're usually scared, and so the angel has to calm them down. No, it's all right. I'm very smart, but I bring good tidings. Because, you know, angels are pure intuitive, right? They, they really know. They're not just little flying babies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that one. Um, another number from the album that I'd like to go over is written there, Poor Wayfaring Stranger. So this is, again, another old traditional American tune that's been sung by many artists, including Johnny Cash, the a great version. And this, this song also has really strong biblical and theological uh, foundations. So that's a, another reason I think why a lot of these old hymns are so powerful and effective, because the, the theology is really strong, it's based in, in the Bible. So they, they teach good objective truth, but then they also subjectively inspire us. So the first verse, of course, well, this one goes like this. I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger traveling through this world below. There's no sickness, no toil or danger in that bright land to which I go. I'm going there to see my father. Said he'd meet me when I come. I'm just going over Jordan. I'm just going over home. So the singer identifies himself as a wayfarer, the poor wayfaring stranger, traveling through the wilderness, over the river Jordan, and going home. So it's another song about going to heaven like Angel Man, but it has a different emphasis. The image of going over Jordan, of course, harkens back to, to a prior event, the whole event of the Exodus. Okay, so the arc of this story is slavery, oppression in Egypt of the, of the Israelite people, and then liberation from that oppression through the instrumentality of Moses, who is a very important type of Christ, really foreshadows Christ. They go to the Red Sea, in which the Egyptians, their enemies are vanquished. There's that time in the desert, a time of purification, a time of education and, and true worship, right? And purification from the old ways. And finally, after many years, entrance into the promised land through the River Jordan, through another river. So this is a common theme in a lot of gospel songs, a lot of bluegrass songs that sing of liberation. So there's the, the idea of being liberated in this life, you know, especially being liberated from slavery, but there's also the image of ultimate liberation. Okay? Liberation leading into heaven. And, and the story of, of Exodus, is, it's also a dominant narrative for the church fathers who saw in it a really fitting metaphor for man's freedom from sin in Christ. Okay? Everything that happens there, uh, we can see ourselves there. We can insert ourselves and, and, and see how we're being, being purified, liberated, and wandering at times. And that actually in one way, life is a, is a wandering. Life is a pilgrimage. And, and it's, it's not going to be um, complete until we cross over at that final Jordan. So this song is especially about this purification part. That the way to heaven is difficult, can be difficult. And so the... Uh, then the next verse indicates this especially. I know dark clouds will gather round me. I know my way is hard and steep. But beauteous fields arise before me. Where God's redeemed, their vigils keep. So we know that the Exodus, the 
Israelites that journey they made was often a time of desperate wandering. Now God provided in very important ways, but it wasn't easy. It included difficult ways, ways hard and steep. But still, the singer has his faith. He sees the beauteous fields arise before him. Um, you know, the Israelites, they approached the Jordan from east to west. So you can kind of imagine them seeing those beauteous fields of the land of milk and honey arising before them. And as an aside, I think it's interesting that the, this song really emphasizes the, the redeemed that have gone before that the singer will see. And so that, you know, oftentimes Protestants are Catholic in spite of themselves. You know, that, yeah, we, you know, there are others who have gone before. There are saints who keep vigil for us. Because of the, this song and a lot of these songs come out of the Protestant tradition. But because they're so scriptural, they're pretty Catholic. The image of the wayfarer, too, it's, it's also a, a, a theological term, okay? So St. Augustine and Aquinas use it as a category by which to understand who man is in this life. So man is a viator, that's the Latin, right? A pilgrim in this life. And that's why we take pilgrimages. They're, you know, they can be very fun. We can have a lot of cappuccinos and good pasta and see piazzas and stuff like that. But they also remind us of who we are in this life. Yatu, a pilgrim, you know, and where we're going, we're going home. And a little bit more about this idea is that, so man as a pilgrim, Aquinas develops this nicely to, to talk about the ways that man can know God. The, the man, go, man knows God in a sense naturally, that we can know God as our creator, right? But man can also be redeemed in grace. Man in grace here below. But then ultimately, man will be in grace in heaven. And that and that's different. That's a passage. That's as man is comprehensive, man in heaven, when he will see God face to face. But by what, what Aquinas refers to as the light of glory. And so we know by different lights. We know we can know by a natural light, those who do not have grace can still know God to some extent. And then in grace, then we have this great faith, right? Faith of love, <clears throat> to see what we're talking about, to see death as a passage. Um, but then where we're going is eventually this final light, the light of glory. So, yeah, these songs are, are theologically rich and, and highly singable. They speak to us, of us, of our mortality, in our journey that we have in a mortal over Jordan. And I think another reason why it's important to, to uh, think of well, the last things or, or any important theological consideration through art is that art, good art, gives us new perspective. It sheds a different light on things. So it's one thing to just rattle off um, the four last things, but it's another thing to, uh, to sing about it and to interiorize in that way. Yeah. So finally, I want to kind of complete the picture here by talking a little bit about prayer, especially prayer to Mary, because you're not going to find much appeal to Mary in um, you know, these old American hymns. But Mary is a great teacher, maybe our greatest teacher and intercessor for preparing for death and dying well. So I want to finish with a few Mary reflections. I think Mary is complimentary here, especially because she was a wayfarer. Mary was a pilgrim, so she's a model for us here. And, and she recapitulates in her own life some important Old Testament themes. You know, this idea of recapitulation, um, St. Irenaeus uses it of Christ, that, that Christ was victorious in ways that others had fallen, you know, where Adam fell, Christ was victorious. Um, or that, that Christ um, in himself performs certain important Old Testament themes and prophecies. 
But Mary does this as well. So Mary said yes to God, where Eve said no, for example. Um, she is the new Ark of the Covenant who bears the word in herself. She makes the journey from Egypt to the Promised Land with the word, right? Kind of mirroring the, the, the Israelites' journey. But, but hers, guided by the Spirit, she didn't wander, she went straight away. But Joseph, of course. But this difficult journey is also known as one of the seven sorrows of Mary. All right, so that so the Mary, Mary is this pilgrim, but she also experienced sorrow in her life. And she experienced trials. And there, there are other sorrows, you know, Simeon's prediction that a sword would pierce her heart, losing the Christ child on, on the way back to, to Galilee, after Jerusalem and, and other sorrows experienced in the passion of her son. There's sorrow, but there's also joy. It's, it's interesting how um, we, we see this especially in the rosary, that we pray a joyful mystery, such as the finding of the Christ child, but it was immediately preceded by one of the seven sorrows, right? So there's this um, great intuition we have in, uh, just from reflecting on Mary's life, that there is joy, there is sorrow, that's part of life, right? Yeah, so I think just a couple more reflections just on Mary, that she journeyed through this veil of tears. That she's like this explorer, trailblazing for the rest of us. And we can con contrast our, our valley of tears, kind of following Mary, following Christ, with uh, the Silicon Valley I mentioned earlier, where they're, you know, where they're busy escaping death, trying to control death through technology. In the Veil of Tears, Mary just followed Christ, and that's why we beseech her in prayer, that, that we too might follow Christ. And we're looking to Mary, contemplating her pilgrimage, and asking for our prayers, are, are sure ways to prepare for our own death. And the Hail Mary is probably the finest prayer preparation. It's, um, it's a prayer for perseverance. So perseverance is also a grace. It's something that we need to receive, something that we need to ask for every day, that we would actually persevere to the end. This, too, is a gift and something that we need to pray for. And in the Hail Mary, we get these two most important moments that we're praying for now and at the hour of our death probably the most two important moments in our life. We need it now, we need it at the end. And this is good Christian preparation for a holy death. So let's beseech Mary for God's good grace now and when we're dying. Hopefully we can die with this prayer in our lives. Because one day those two moments, now and the hour of our death, will be the same. So there's something, or maybe some things, about dying let us conclude with the Hail Mary as we pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Time for a couple of questions. If you have any. Yes, a few. I have several, but the first one is um, my father's almost 90. His birthday's approaching, and now I know what I'm going to give him for his birthday, which is the CD. Yeah, um, okay, great. Got a sale. He, <laughs> He's been in choirs and singing his whole life and is still, in fact, singing in the Stamroff Chorus at almost 90. Um, but he's not Catholic, nor was I as a child. I don't think he was baptized. 
And recently, as his death is getting closer and closer, I'm praying more and more for him to have a happy death and a happy eternity, although I don't exactly know what that is going to be for him and that he's not been baptized. At the same time, he's lived a life devoted to service. Um, some of the chapters from Matthew are his favorite in the whole world, although he doesn't particularly consider himself a, a Christian. Um, so I don't know what, what you can say about um, basically praying for family members who are in dubious conditions from a conventional Catholic point of view. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah, that's a great question. We can, we can all keep you and your father in our prayers. Um, that's one good way we can do it. Uh, more prayers. Um, well, you could, uh, we have the model of St. Monica. Um, now, that's a little bit different because your father's daughter, obviously. But, you know, Monica persevered in prayer for Augustine, her wayward son. Um, and Augustine eventually became this great saint and defender of the faith. So, yeah, I would say prayer, continued prayer and, uh, and discussion, uh, you know, being straightforward. Father, but in a loving way, because um, you, you know you owe your dad that, that love as his child. And of course, the, the church, the way the way the church looks at the sacraments, that the sacraments are the, the way we know how to um, receive this faith we're talking about, this love we're talking about. But like I said, we have a we have a natural knowledge of God as well. So your your father has a natural knowledge of God, and. Um, by that natural light, he has, um, in his in his way, tried to pursue service, and, um, and that God is, uh, although we, this is the way for us, the sacraments are the way for us to achieve salvation. God is not bound by his sacraments, um, so that we don't give up hope for those who died without sacraments. Brother Justin, I want your opinion of this following. Everybody in here, uh, ladies and gentlemen, have heard and read, have seen uh, people dying uh, on the surgical bed, I mean, you know, in the hospitals, and 15 minutes later, 20 minutes later, they come back from the dead, mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, according to them. Uh, I've often wondered about this. Uh, there's books on it. Uh, I think that one of the recent books uh, a few years ago was a neurosurgeon who died himself, and he came back and wrote this book about his experiences. Uh, my question, or asking you your opinion, what do you think? Is there credibility in these kinds of things, or is it more of uh, selling the books? Uh, you know, because everybody wants to have something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. What's your What's your opinion of this? Um, you mean like, is there credibility to their uh, having some sort of near death experience and and um, <coughs> talking about that? Yeah, because it seems like many. Yeah, you read about this all the time. Um, NDEs, near death experiences, and that there's there's some sort of uh, similar similar. We can find similarities among all the different, many different ones is that there's a light or there's this experience of warmth. Um, and there's also this, maybe some people um, come to know certain things and then are resuscitated. So I don't, I don't know, I actually haven't really read much besides what I've heard right there. Um, uh, but it certainly sounds like a phenomenon. Um, people have this, this momentary, yeah, experience of the afterlife, and then somehow um, are returned and uh, yeah, regain consciousness. Um, so I, I, I honestly haven't looked into it too much, but since it seems like an experience that many people have, it's probably good to give some credence to it.
Is it true that the person dying, that the, uh, the devil affects the most at that time? Uh, to try to get the person to give up? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a tradition, is that, I mean, we would say that the, uh, the, you know, the evil one is, uh, attacks us at different times, probably at different important times, and uh, since the final moments are very important, one, one could easily surmise that yes, there it seems like it would be uh, that, that that would be a dynamic, which is again why what we pray the Hail Mary and includes that moment. I think that's that's very telling. Um, so, given that, it's important to really trust that that indeed we will be we will have our angel band around us, you know, with their wings smacking out those demons. And then, and then, you know, hopefully led by Mary, you know, really protecting us. Um, what's the church's teachings on mediums? Um, you hear them on the television shows. On what? They have these mediums where, you know, they, they people um, have people die. And so they go to this medium to want to talk oh, to their dead people, yeah. uh, their, their dead mother or their relative. Um, what is the church's teachings on that and, um, and, and the belief in that? Because you'll see these shows and they seem like they're really hitting those people, um, or she's telling them uh, things that um, nobody else would have known about mm -hmm. this loved one that had died. Right. Um, and trying to bring consolation to them. So, yeah. it's essential that the church teaches. Well, it's interesting in uh, the Office of Readings recently, in, in the uh, Liturgy of the Hours, which we pray every day together in community, um, we read about Saul, King Saul, and seeking out a medium. So, it seems, yes, that this is a phenomenon. Okay, this, this happens. Um, and, uh, but it's also illicit, um, it's a cult, and so, yeah, we would just say, stay away from that, because it's, uh, you know, it's not one of the ways that we've been taught to pray, it's not one of the ways we've been taught to worship. Um, again, there's, there's um, one image of the Israelites in the desert is being purified, from, their, from the old ways and being taught true worship. And, uh, and, the, and then this different prophets return to this too. Hosea returns to this. You know, bring, I'll bring you back to the desert. Um, and so God has taught us true worship. And so there are um, other, other ways that are illicit and dangerous. Um, and uh, and that's, that's too why we include them in a Examination of conscience, for example, so that one has engaged in this, that they will confess that. Yep. Uh, yes, I have a uh, recent uh, experience. Jacinta was with me outside of uh, Our Lady Comfort Afflicted. Father B. Fialk, who's been studying the wonderful uh, Catholic rite of exorcism, I told this uh, recently that um, there was this young man in his 30s and he had this father, a very bad father, who was just uh, just very wicked and, and teaching this young man you know, how to steal and, and, and commit various crimes, which led to uh, this young man's uh, drug addiction. The father was, was a drug trafficker locally. And uh, so, so just recently, this young man in his 30s, he, you know, he became ad addicted to whatever drug may be heroin, and uh, so he overdoses, and he's, he's rushed to the hospital, and on the hospital bed, he, he dies physiologically, he, his heart stops, he's dead. So there was the young, uh, I don't know if she was young or not, but a woman, Catholic woman attendant at the hospital comes up on that right above him on the uh, bed and just starts praying whatever she's praying. And 
all of a sudden he, 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 he wakes up, he comes back to life. So he proceeds to say that, and this would have been while he was technically deceased, that he went somewhere where he was in this uh, place and this figure Began to out in the distance began to approach him, and as this figure got closer, this figure bore these horns, ferocious horns. And um, I should have regressed and say his father had had passed away already. The, the father that taught him was responsible for him ODing, so the father was, was was deceased. So, but anyway, there this figure is approaching him, and you can see that this figure has horns, and he reaches for this young young man and says come with me we're going to see your father and he just instantly said no and i guess that's when that's when he woke up and and he asked for father b and uh, father b went to had an appointment with him, uh, soon after so just following up with a couple of those earlier questions wow that's pretty intense Uh, thank you for this great talk, Brother Justin. I had a quick question about the relationship between sin and death and God's role in this. I'm particularly referencing St. Paul's letter to the Romans. I believe it's in chapter 5. He talks about how death came through sin into the world, that it was not death prior to the fall. At least man seemed not to die. Um, and yet on account of sin, we do experience suffering and death. And so I was wondering if you could maybe draw a distinction between the death that might be natural to man and the death that man experiences on account of sin. Right. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, somehow, uh, you know, so in the, in, in the garden, Adam and Eve, man was in, what we say, original justice, and th that original justice included this ordering within man. So man was ordered in himself. Um, he was ordered to reason, okay, his body and soul. And then he was also ordered to God. Okay. And this included, um, yeah, the absence of mortality, right? The absence of death. And that, and that with, with sin, we get this as one of the effects, All right? Um, but, like, as you intimated, there is, um, there's another sin, I mean, there's another death actually, um, there's, there's a death worse than physical death, right? So there, there, are, there are these effects of original sin that, that we feel, okay? We, we feel our whole, our whole life. It's um, ignorance in our intellect that we don't know everything, okay? Um, malice in our wills, right? Where we are not always wishing the good of others. Um, we have concupiscence in our desire for, for yummy things, okay, and our physical appetite is, is disordered. And then we also have um, cowardice or fear, and we, we lack courage, right? And, and so grace kind of works on this our whole life, right? And, and we, can, we can overcome these wounds of original sin that linger even after our baptism. But, it's actually in this um, interesting way, in this St. Francis's Laudes Creaturarum Canticle of uh, Creatures, or Canticle of the Sun as it's called, where he talks about the second death. So for those who die in grace, the second death can do no harm. So what is the second death? Well, we, we read about this a lot in Revelation, and it's, um, it's basically, it's the judgment of, of hell. So for those who receive that, that is the second death. Um, for those who, for, for those who um, are, are righteous, those who are turned to God, those who love God, who, they don't. This doesn't happen. There isn't a second death. Um, rather, they live with God, and then in the resurrection of the body, they live forever. Uh, we, we, we 
profess this, I believe in the resurrection of the body. We're not talking about Christ's resurrection. We do believe in that. Uh, but we're talking about Rome. We don't, we, don't, we don't dwell on this enough that our bodies, too, will rise. You might say, well, I sure hope it's a different body than the one I got right now. But um, <laughs> apparently it'll be a really good one. You know, so there'll be a perfect, perfect heaven, perfect earth. This, um, this original perfection, right? This, that original justice that was that Adam, Adam and Eve experienced, that will be renewed, but kind of on a higher level. It's kind of yeah. maybe one more question, Josh. Um. Thank you again for your talk, Brother Justin. Um, you know, um, and I love the connection you made between music, sacred music, and death, and especially you're talking about your CD and how uh, it relates to the four last things. I listen to four-way things, Stranger, about three times a week. But, um, right, you get prepared. But, um, so, and you know, the church, both Catholic and Protestant, has a tradition of hymns relating to death uh, are used at funerals, etc. So what would, I know this might sound like an odd question, but what would your favorite hymn having to do with this topic be? Oh gosh. Uh, that's a tough one. Oh gosh. Well, you know, maybe, because I've, I've actually, we've, we've experienced this, I've experienced this as a brother of the order. Uh, a tradition that we have is, as well, one of our brothers is passing away, and we would sing the Salve Regina, which we'll sing in a few minutes together after uh, night prayer. So as they're passing, you know, you sing that, sing about the, the Valley of Tears, um, and again, for Mary's protection at the end. So I think, yeah, I, I, I pray that that would happen to me, too. Very nice. And I have one request before we go into comment. Perhaps, Brother Justin, you could uh, say something about the availability of your album. Where, where can we get it? Oh, sure. Thank you, Father Nicholas. Yes. Remember, all proceeds go to our formation so that we can, um, uh, yeah. receive this great education that we have, um, pay for our dental bills and things like that. So anyway, uh, all the proceeds go to that. And you can find the album on um, iTunes, Amazon.com, uh, Spotify, if you like that. There's also a website where you can buy a physical copy, which is called cdbaby.com. So if you go to that website and search Hillbilly Thomists, so that's Hillbilly T H O M I S T S Thomas. You'll find it. And the uh, the story behind the name is another story. Going to another time. Thank you.